word for clinging, upadana, also means to feed. Upadana of a tree is the soil that it feeds on. So it means food, sustenance, and also the act of taking sustenance, i.e. feeding. And we apply it to the mind. It's the place where you look for happiness. It's something you feel that the life of your happiness depends, depends on having that person, that situation, whatever it is, to keep your happiness alive. And for most of us, our emotional feeding is with other people. And it's this aspect that the Buddha says is conducive to suffering. That if our happiness depends on things that are going to change, that subject to aging, illness, and death, that our happiness is going to age, grow ill, and die as well. This is why we have to look elsewhere for our true happiness. It's why we train the mind to develop qualities inside that can provide that happiness. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't continue to feel love, affection, compassion for people outside simply that we don't have to lean on them anymore, which helps to make the compassion less of a burden for both sides. On the one hand, the Buddha has us develop compassion for everybody. It's one of the Brahma Viharas, unlimited compassion, realizing that there are people out there suffering, and you would like to do what you can to stop their suffering. You'd also like them to act in ways that can help eliminate suffering. That's an aspect of the Brahma Viharas that's often missed. It's not simply a floating around and kind of wish for people to be happy. It also requires an understanding. Why are people unhappy? Well, it comes from their actions, maybe past actions, maybe present actions. And so you want to think of them doing things that are skillful. If their past actions make it difficult to avoid physical pain right now, at least you hope that they'll be able to find a way of dealing with the pain so they don't have to suffer from it. And you also wish for them to do things that will prevent suffering in the future as well. There's also a more particular kind of compassion. It comes out of gratitude. The Buddha recognizes that we do have special connections with other people, particularly with our parents, but also to anyone who has been helpful to us in this lifetime. And those connections call for gratitude, which means these are the people for whom you want to give some special help. You've probably heard of that passage where the Buddha says, well, on the one hand, a sign of a good person is gratitude. The good person recognizes the good that has been done for him or for her and wants to repay it. In particular, you've got a debt of gratitude to your parents. In the beginning, you literally fed on your mother when she was pregnant with you. You took nourishment from her blood. When you're born, you took her milk. And as you're a young child, you have to feed emotionally on your, on your mother. As you grow, old, grow older, you found other sources of nourishment, emotional nourishment. But you still have this enormous debt to your mother and to your father for having given you life. And the Buddha said the best way to repay that is not necessarily to obey your parents. Because there are times when your parents have all sorts of wrong-headed notions. The best way to repay them is, if you find that they're stingy, is to try to find some way of influencing them so they can become more, more generous. 
and they're not observing the precepts, try to get them to have, have more precepts, more principles in their lives. In other words, introduce them to the Dharma in as diplomatic a way as possible. And some parents resent their children trying to teach them, so you have to learn to do this in an indirect way. Others resent the B word. So you don't have to couch these teachings as Buddhist teachings. But you do have that special debt. And you have other debts as well. And there's a sense of affection that goes, should go along with the debts. As the Buddha said, when a young monk ordains, he should regard his preceptor or his other teachers as his father. And the teachers and preceptors should regard the young monk as a son. There is that special connection that lasts as long as both are still monks and still alive. And it entails various duties, looking after each other. So there is room for a special affection. But the Buddha also warns, warns that special affections can sometimes entail dangers. He talks about hatred that comes from affection, affection that comes from hatred. In other words, if there's somebody you love and there's somebody else who's been nasty to that person, okay, you're going to hate the person who's nasty to the person you love. Or if there's somebody you really hate and somebody else hates that person, you're going to be affectionate toward that person. In other words, affection is not always pure. And so this is where you have to exercise equanimity, realizing that sometimes affection can draw you into unskillful mind states, which you've got to watch out for. This is why the Brahma Viharas don't have just goodwill, compassion, and empathetic joy, which basically come down to goodwill. Compassion is what goodwill feels when it encounters suffering. Empathetic joy is what goodwill encounters when it sees someone who's already happy. Those three are a set. But there's also equanimity, the ability to step back. And it's, that should be practiced so it can be unlimited as well. In other words, seeing there are times when your partiality toward a particular person is going to cause trouble, not only for you, but sometimes for that person as well. If somebody is really sick and all you can do is get upset about their sickness, you're going to be less effective in helping them. You have to remind yourself, we're all subject to aging, all subject to illness, all subject to death, all subject to separation. There's no way you can avoid this. There's an account in the canon where King Basenity is talking to the Buddha and someone comes up and whispers in his ear that Queen Malika, his favorite queen, has died. He just breaks down and cries. And the Buddha's way of consoling it was interesting. He reminds him, since when have you ever heard of someone who was born who did not grow ill, did not die? We're all subject to these things. And it's amazing how taking a larger view like that can help console you. In other words, you're not one being singled out to suffer. It may seem that way in the beginning, but you realize there's suffering all over the place, people dying all over the place, what, 200,000 every day. Illness is everywhere. Aging is everywhere. So when these things become apparent both in ourselves and our loved ones, that's when we have to develop equanimity, realizing that this is the way things are. And we look for another source of happiness deeper inside. If we're feeding inside, and we don't have to feed outside, then we can be much more effective at actually being helpful to people who are suffering one way or another. So it's important you realize that the Buddha's teaching against clinging is not a teaching against affection, or against gratitude, or against goodwill. And it's not his teachings on the Baba Vihar is don't it's not the case that they don't recognize that there are people to whom we owe special debts. There is that teaching, the Buddha said, that you can't find anybody 
who has not been your mother in some lifetime, father, sister, brother, child. But it's interesting, he doesn't use that teaching as a basis for universal love, because we know how difficult relations can be with mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and children. Teaching is meant to encourage a sense of sangwega. The realization of how long this wandering on has been going on. Now your special debts in this lifetime are the people who actually have been your parents this time around. Have yeah, been your parents, your special affection does go to your children this time around. But we have to realize that there are limitations on these affections. Affection can lead to suffering. It's the case of Lady Wisaka, who's coming from a funeral for one of her grandchildren. And here she had just been to a funeral, still, the Buddha asked her, Would you like to have as many grandchildren as there are? people in the city? And she said, oh yes, lots and lots of grandchildren, that'd be great. And he said, but how many, would there be a day when you wouldn't be going to a funeral? And she realized, well, no. There's another case of a man coming to a funeral, the funeral of his son. And the Buddha makes a comment, well yes, suffering does come from those who are dear. The man gets upset. He feels, well, happiness comes from those who are dear. Well, the real suffering comes from our need to find our happiness from these other people, from our need to keep feeding on these other people. There is a way to overcome that, and that's learn how to find that deeper happiness inside. It comes from training the mind. There's one point where Ananda asks, sorry, Buddha. This was after Sarabhut had made the statement that he sat down to think one day, was there any change in the world that would cause him grief? He realized that there wasn't at that point. He'd, come in, he'd become an arahant. Ananda immediately asked him, well, what about if something happened to the Buddha? Wouldn't that cause you grief? And Sarabhut said, well, no. I reflect that it's a sad thing that such a wonderful person had passed away. He was no longer able to help the world. And in Nana's comment, it's interesting, he says, oh, it's a sign that Sariputta has no conceit. In other words, our grief over the loss of other people really comes down to our sense of loss, my loss, what this is doing to what I am. If we can learn how to get away from that attachment, then we can have affection for others. Pay special attention to those to whom we have special debts. But we don't have to suffer for it. And that's why it's important that we make these, these distinctions, the difference between clinging and affection, the difference between general goodwill for all and the specific goodwill we have for people who have been good to us. If we're clear about these distinctions, then we can express goodwill, feel love, feel affection in ways that don't cause suffering.